This video is brought to you by Squarespace. I see. No, I'm glad you called. In fact, I've been waiting for a good excuse to reassemble the team. As soon as I can do so, we'll look into it. Not at all. What's up guys, RBG here hitting you with another MCU related video and I just want to say thanks to all those who gave my first video a chance. We currently have over 100k views and over 2000 likes so I think the positive reception indicates that you guys are really interested in what I have to say in regards to the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. One of my main goals is to give you a clear understanding of how things work and what you should expect with these movies. What I don't want to do is totally mislead you like other channels are doing because there are a lot of content creators out there who will tell you what you want to hear for clicks. Like there are obviously things you want to see in the new phase of Marvel movies and when you hear about them potentially happening you tend to click on the video. One of the main things being the inclusion of the X-Men. This has undoubtedly been something that everyone has been salivating over especially since any video that dares mention them in the same sentence with the MCU goes viral. And you also have things that get taken totally out of context because of the high demand of the X-Men's inclusion in the Marvel movies. For example, about a month ago, the official Marvel Entertainment Twitter account caused a bit of a hype storm when they posted a very cryptic tweet. And rightfully so, fans as well as YouTube content creators started speculating that this tweet could be hinting at Kevin Feige's plans for the X-Men in Phase 4. Like that tweet got a whopping 22k favorites, so this was causing quite a bit of anticipation regarding Marvel's next arc in their cinematic universe. Even though we had heard murmurings about them working on films about Black Widow, Shang-Chi, and the Eternals, so much about their future slate remained a mystery. So that would have been the perfect time to unveil what they were working on with the iconic mutant team. But as it turns out, the big reveal was a promotion for the new Jonathan Hickman X-Men comic books by teasing it cryptically, which is something they're very bad with. Like they know that the MCU fanbase can be a cesspool of speculation. I mean, you gotta admit, we love to correlate everything with the movies, which just shows how impactful Marvel Studios has been to Hollywood cinema. So their branding divisions take advantage of this and tries to pull those fans over to their other properties like the comics and the shows. There was a similar case with the mysterious Spider-Man miniseries that's being co-written by J.J. Abrams because if you remember Marvel Entertainment thought it'd be a bright idea to start their countdown with a number 4. And this caused people to believe that this had something to do with the Fantastic Four being in the MCU or a possible fourth installment to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, which was totally not the case. So I think it's better to hear straight from the horse's mouth when it comes to these things. Unless you hear it directly from Kevin Feige or Marvel Studios, it's just a speculation or it's flat out not true. But anyways, let's get back on the topic of the X-Men making their MCU debut. Because recently, Kevin Feige actually did say that they have plans for these quote unquote mutants, but it won't be for phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And there's, and there's, there's no time left to talk about mutants. And how mutants but so it's going to be a while before we see them pop up. Which in my opinion is the right move to make because the Fox X-Men films are still fresh on our minds with installments like Deadpool 2, X-Men Apocalypse, and Dark Phoenix. The best thing Marvel Studios should do is put them on the back burner and make the fans actually miss the X-Men. Because it's obvious that franchise fatigue is starting to set in and as we all know, although these characters originated in the comics and were killing it in their respective platform, the movies eventually became the ultimate representation of the franchise. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing because as I mentioned in my previous MCU video, movies like Blade only increased the popularity of the character and their comics. And the Marvel Cinematic Universe has undoubtedly become the central nervous system, the freaking nucleus of all things Marvel. Like you can't go without seeing them in any iteration whether it be comics or cartoons having some form of MCU influence in them. But sometimes those influences can leave a negative impact on the franchise as I'm sure you're aware with the X-Men films. There have been some successful X-Men films but recently there have been more misses than hits with these movies. And for a while the comic book sales suffered because of the poor representation. We live in an age where people absolutely hate anything related to the Dark Phoenix saga because the movies have done a poor job showing how awesome it can be. But thankfully, Kevin Feige and the brilliant minds at Marvel Studios can rectify this glaring issue that X-Men have been having. And I have some good ideas on how they'll do this. Firstly, we have to take a look at what makes the MCU stand out from the rest of the superhero films. 
For the longest time, superhero films chose to loosely adapt stories from their comic book lore while keeping the movie somewhat grounded. And to some extent, that storytelling worked, but it didn't always turn out well. Sometimes the film studios would find themselves compromising which direction they'd want to fully go in. On one hand, you have those fans who want the movies to completely follow the lore, and on the other hand, there were moviegoers who found the comic book elements too hokey and unrealistic for their tastes. What Marvel Studios did differently from other productions is appease both audiences, creating this cinematic world that features all the characters we know and love in a reimagined and modernized setting that harps on issues of the current time. I know I've said this in one of my Marvel's Avengers videos, but a good majority of the MCU films took place in the concurrent year they were released in, with the exception of a few mainly being the first Captain America film, Guardians 2, Captain Marvel, Endgame, and a few others, but a good majority of them took place in the time they were released, and all the characters maintained all of their core concepts while existing in these modern times. This has been a very potent form of storytelling for Marvel Studios that seems like something they originally came up with on their own, but on the contrary, it's not not as original as some may think. Yeah, they do a good job of balancing those fantasy comic elements and grounding them, and it may have seemed like they were the first to master this concept. But the first to actually do this was the Marvel Comics lore, more specifically the Earth 1610 Ultimate Comics which Marvel Studios has borrowed heavily from. Because like the MCU films, they also feature reimagined and updated versions of the company's most popular superhero characters, including Spider-Man, Wolverine, the Hulk, Thor, and Daredevil. And all the characters and their origins went into major overhauls, freeing them from the sometimes convoluted back histories of the original versions, which for the longest time turned off new readers because of the extensive histories. Talented writers like Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Miller were at the forefront of this ultimate universe and they undoubtedly helped in shaping the current landscape of Marvel. Like, you can't go one movie without seeing a reference or flat out creation from Brian Michael Bendis in the MCU. Like, when you look at their live action portrayal of Peter Parker, you instantly think of Brian Michael Bendis' Ultimate Spider-Man. He's even influenced non-MCU related films like Into the Spider-Verse. And I'm not just trying to give all the credit to the Ultimate Universe because Marvel Studios borrows from the other lore like the Earth 616 comics which is made apparent by the use of storylines like Civil War. But that's another story that comes from the brilliant mind of Mark Miller. Like these guys are a big deal and they will continue to affect comics and movies for years to come. One story that I have a strong feeling that Marvel Studios will borrow from is the Ultimate Origins comics. This is one of the later comics that backtracks and goes more in depth of how superheroes were introduced into the human population. And it all begins with the Super Soldier program. This is what it was all originally about, essentially creating a hero who would turn the tide. So during World War II, President Roosevelt pushed the government to create America's first Super Soldier. And that's how we ultimately get Captain America, which the MCU borrows heavily from with the super skinny Steve Rogers. But anyways, in response to America creating the first Super Soldier, other countries would try to race and make their own versions of Captain America. One of the main ones being Canada, who was already aligned with America in their battle with the Nazis. So they end up abducting three soldiers, and James Hallett, better known as Logan, was one of them. They take him to the Weapon X complex for experiments and he manages to escape but he winds up getting shot before he nears freedom. The Weapon X soldiers notice that his wounds somehow have healed and one of the doctors explains that in attempting to create their own version of Captain America, they accidentally discovered a genome that when genetically altered, grants the person carrying it various abilities based on their DNA. They would label these genetically altered humans quote unquote mutants, and James Howlett aka Wolverine would be the first mutant they discover in the ultimate timeline, and rightfully so was dubbed Mutant Zero. Now what's interesting about this particular story is how mutants were initially looked at because you'd think that Weapon X would look at Mutant Zero as a failure because they failed to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. But it turned out to be the exact opposite because the lead scientist Abraham Cornelius believed that mankind would eventually become extinct from constant war and this new mutant gene would ensure humanity's survival. So as a precautionary measure to prevent humans from ever going extinct, Weapon X spread the mutant genome around the world resulting in the creation of the mutant race. So as you can see, when it comes to X-Men, Marvel Studios can basically introduce them anywhere in their established timeline. They could easily go into a World War II recap and show that they had other nations desperately trying to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. As a matter of fact, they've already established that this was the case in a few of their earlier films. You obviously have Hydra who ultimately got their hands on the perfectly recreated serum after Bucky Barnes killed Howard and Maria Stark in 1991. And fast forward to 2001, General Ross attempts to relaunch the Biotech Force Enhancement Project, which was basically a failed attempt to reproduce the serum with added gamma radiation that led to Bruce Banner transforming into the Hulk. 
And this is another instance that's very similar to the Ultimate Comics. Like, Banner's transformation is labeled a mutation in the Ultimate Comics. Of course, Marvel Studios couldn't call it that at the time since the words mutant and mutation were owned by Fox, but it's looking like they may use that terminology now that they officially own the X-Men and everything associated with them. And they can use the Super Soldier Serum as a plot device to drive the narrative forward, because that's basically all it was in the Ultimate Universe comics. A way to connect all the many superheroes to Captain America's Super Soldier Serum in one form or another, whether it be intentional or an accident. That's basically how we got Spider-Man in that particular round of the comics. Norman Osborn accidentally creates Spider-Man while attempting to recreate the serum for the government. Don't be surprised if Marvel Studios decides to reuse that origin for Spider-Man because the MCU never really went into detail of how Peter got his powers. We don't know if he was bitten by an Oz formula infused spider or what. I'm just getting excited even thinking about all the possibilities they could use with this super soldier serum. Like we already have a confirmation of the Red Guardian appearing in the new Black Widow movie. And he's basically a Russian Captain America so I think it's safe to assume that the super soldier serum plot device will still be utilized in future MCU films. Everyone's gonna be trying to come up with their own version of America's ass. But let's talk about how the mutants will surface in modern times because I already mentioned that they could potentially be created in the 1940s. As I mentioned earlier, humans who have that mutant genealogy can gain various abilities if they're genetically altered in any kind of way. So let's just say that the Weapon X or someone depending on what Marvel changes it to spreads the genome around the world in the 1940s and it didn't really have an instant effect on humans and their offspring, they would need something to trigger those powers. Now, theoretically, we already have Bruce Banner who was injected with a remade super soldier serum and mutated by gamma radiation, so there's one. But we also have well-known characters who are heavily associated with X-Men and mutants in general. And that's Wanda and Pietro Maximoff, also known as Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. Two mutants who are offsprings of one of the most powerful villains in the X-Men comics. And one of the things I find interesting about the MCU's versions of these characters is that they're very similar to mutants in the Ultimate comics. They were experiments who were exposed to cosmic energy from the scepter which turned out to be the Mind Stone. This energy proved to be fatal to other volunteers but somehow the twins survived and the energy ended up unlocking superpowers that were latent within them. So what's not to say that Wanda and Pietro didn't already have the mutant genome coursing through them and it just so happened to be altered by the stone, granting them with powers like psionic energy manipulation and super speed. I think you see where I'm going with this. That's why I say that the mutants can be introduced at any time in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because they pretty much already been included without Marvel Studios flat out having to say they are. Now that they have the rights to actually say the words mutant or mutation, they can classify Wanda as such. And now that we've established that the mutants possess powers that are laid dormant and can be fully tapped into by something like cosmic energy or radiation, we're gonna need a power source that'll create mutants all over the world and completely shape the Marvel Cinematic Universe to its core. And I think it'll be the infamous Infinity Gauntlet snap. Spoilers to those who haven't seen Infinity War or Endgame, but it was revealed that after Thanos used the full power of the Infinity Stones on Earth, it let out a large burst of energy. And at the end of Endgame, when the Avengers are deciding on who should use the nano gauntlets to harness the stones, Bruce Banner ultimately deduces that their energy is mostly gamma radiation. Now what's funny is that the snap was done three times on Earth. One from Thanos in Wakanda, a second time by Professor Hulk, and a third by Tony Stark. So that's a good amount of gamma radiation or cosmic energy exposure to Earth's inhabitants, especially ones who carry the mutant genome and haven't unlocked their abilities. Can you imagine how impactful that would be? Not to mention that those mutant genes just don't stop at superpowers. You also have the ones who are physically altered by the mutation like the Hulk. Those are going to be some of the most devastating characters that will undoubtedly cause a seismic shift in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Just look at Scarlet Witch. She already caused quite a stir after accidentally killing a few Nigerian civilians in Civil War. So the lingering seeds of fear for superhumans and mutants have already been planted. And you just know that Marvel Studios is really gonna up the ante on her powers in her WandaVision series. Like they barely scratched the surface with Scarlet Witch's powers so I think she's gonna be the leading example of why the mutants are a threat to humanity. We know that mutant powers can be catastrophic if they're untamed or the wielder is over emotional when using them. Because you see how Wanda almost single handedly ripped Thanos in half due to her losing her loved one which is Vision. And if you think about it, it was only a few minutes since Vision was killed in her eyes because as Peter Parker stated, 
what was five years in the actual time felt like five seconds after they were snapped. So I think it's a safe bet that Wanda will still be coping with the death of Vision in her own show and her powers will continue to evolve and potentially prove to be unstable. But anyways, other things we have to wonder about is who will direct the X-Men movies. Like it's obviously going to take a talented director to handle all of these characters. And as we witnessed, the X-Men have been shown to hold up well without any outside assistance from Marvel heroes. You gotta remember, before the Avengers became the box office juggernaut and gained all their popularity, not that many people knew about them. From the late 70s to the early 2000s, it was all about the X-Men. You couldn't go without seeing them in anything, whether it be cartoons, video games, movies, whatever. They were essentially franchise Viagra, man. Like, you could put them in something and whatever that something was, it would only become more awesome. Case in point, the Marvel vs. Capcom games, which all started with X-Men Children of the Atom. So as you can see, it's going to take a lot to translate all of that awesomeness to the big screen and juggle all of those characters. And I think Marvel Studios has proven that they know how to handpick directors who are going to do their properties justice. If you ask me, I think it would be wise if they considered bringing back one of their former directors to work on the X-Men. And that is the guy who proved that we could even have a successful Avengers movie in the first place, Joss Whedon. Say what you want about he stifled the momentum of the Avengers in the Age of Ultron and how you think the Russo bros fixed what he messed up, but if it wasn't for Joss Whedon, the Russos wouldn't necessarily know how to handle a star-studded team. Whedon pretty much laid down the blueprint and landed Marvel's first billion dollar film, not to mention that although the Russos have been a major contribution to the characters like Captain America and the latest Avengers films, keep in mind that they had help. Because while there are two men directing, there were also two men screenwriting all the films the Russos have worked on. Those writers being Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Two guys who have been around since the first Captain America film. So the Russos had a decent amount of help. But guess how many it took to write and direct the first two Avengers films? One person, and it's Joss Whedon. That shows the level of passion and talent that man has, and this is no disrespect to the Russos, but Whedon was the first to successfully put the main cast you know and love into one movie and make them play off of each other. And I think it should be credited to his knowledge of the lore. He knows what makes these characters awesome, and he's managed to translate that to the big screen in the form of these epic sequences that look like splash pages brought to life. So he's proven that he's worthy of directing a movie with a dynamic team like the X-Men. And I'm not sure if a lot of you are even aware of this, but Joss Whedon has written for Marvel Comics way before he was even hired to write and direct their movies. And one of, if not his best work, has been the Astonishing X-Men comics. This took place after Grant Morrison's run and essentially retcons and slightly reboots certain aspects of earlier X-Men comics, and they were freaking awesome, man. There are so many things that Whedon did right with these characters, from often to reduce the number of members to tell a more focused story, to actually putting the X-Men in their original costumes, which for the longest time were these crappy leather uniforms that Grant Morrison insisted that they wear because he thought it didn't make sense for a covert team to wear vibrant colors. But as you can see, Marvel films have proved that that couldn't be any further further from the truth. But anyways, yeah, Whedon has proven that he would be a prime candidate for an X-Men film. He's come up with some original ideas that have already made their way into the MCU. One of them being the Sentient World Observation and Response Department, better known as S.W.O.R.D. During the development of the first Thor movie, Marvel Studios originally intended to feature the intergalactic agency in a post credit scene, but due to film right complications with 20th Century Fox, who at the time owned the X-Men, it was cut. Fast forward to 2019 in Spider-Man Far From Home and we see Nick Fury just chilling on a large space station orbiting Earth, which is very reminiscent of S.W.O.R.D. It hasn't been confirmed that this new ship is actually the S.W.O.R.D. agency, but I think it's safe to assume that it is since the MCU films are going more cosmic. So yeah, Marvel Studios didn't waste any time using some of those newly acquired X-Men entities which just so happened to be created by Joss Whedon. But I could go on and on with this video, I think you guys get my point and hopefully I didn't bore you to death. Marvel Studios desperately needs to revamp the perception of the X-Men franchise and with the right introduction and writers and directors, I believe they'll do just that. But what do you guys think? Do you like my theory of how Marvel could introduce the mutants in the MCU? And who do you think should direct the X-Men films? Let me know down in the comments below. If you enjoyed the vid, it would help me out tremendously if you shared it on social media outlets with all your friends and followers. Sharing really makes a difference. Once again, I want to thank you guys for the awesome turnout on the last video and the massive amount of support you've given me on all of my Marvel related videos. This has definitely inspired me to expand my channel brand to other platforms and I think the first step in doing so is starting a website. That's why I've linked up with Squarespace. In all honesty, I've always been one of those creators who's very apprehensive about making their own website. 
because like a lot of people, I'm not that well versed on web design or the creative process that goes into making a website. Thankfully, Squarespace makes this tedious chore a fun and easy process. It offers a very welcoming guide where you can create a powerful visual experience and utilize templates made by some of the best designers in the world. One of the things that I think is going to benefit me as well as you is how much traffic Squarespace is going to bring to your website. Because they include all the best known practices for search engine optimization without the need of additional plugins. So what are you waiting on? Head on over to squarespace.com with me for a free trial. And when you're ready to lunch, go to squarespace.com slash randomblackgamer to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. The link will be in the description and I'll also leave it pinned in the comments below. But anyways, this is your boy RBG signing out on another video. I will catch you guys later. Peace out.